this will be lecture number 41 on our ongoing series on mechanical measurements. Towards the end of the lecture number 40, we were actually discussing about measurement of radiation properties of surfaces. We had, in, we had given an introduction to the surface properties and then we were trying to look at how surface properties like the reflectivity of a surface can be measured and uh, as a part of that we had introduced what is called an integrating sphere and we will look at it more carefully now and essentially what I am going to do is to look at the use of integrating sphere for two things one is hemispherical directional reflectivity measurement the other one is the directional hemispherical reflectivity measurement and the third one is a use which, which is usually for the measurement of luminosity of a lamp. I will describe it in some brief detail. Subsequently, I will look at the measurement of emissivity by various techniques. So, in the previous lecture, we were looking at the integrating sphere. Integrating sphere is essentially a spherical shell of whose inner surface is given a suitable coating such that the coating is coating provides a highly diffuse surface essentially diffuse surface and also it has got a very high reflectivity more than 95 percent. Such coatings are possible for example, using barium sulphate, magnesium oxide and so on and also some patented surfaces are there which are available from the manufacturers which give you essentially a very highly diffuse, highly reflecting surface. So, let us look at what might happen when you have a integrating sphere and in this case what I am looking at is a beam of light which is shown by a straight line here, this is the incident light which of course may be monochromatic if necessary that means it is coming from a monochromatic source or it is from a polychromatic source which has been monochromatized using a monochromator. So, as it comes and falls on the spherical surface it gets reflected in all directions as indicated by the arrows here only a few arrows have shown and uh, let us see what happens to this reflected radiation. Because of the high reflectivity of the surface most of the light is actually going to be reflected and if you follow what happens to the one which is reflected in this particular direction, you see it is going there again falling on another part of the sphere getting reflected in all directions and again one of them is coming here and getting reflected at this point and then essentially it falls on the reflecting sample after several reflections. So, you can see that the light which is incident through this port or this hole which is falling on a small area on the sphere at this particular location, it gets reflected in all directions and the light which is received by the reflecting sample apparently comes from all directions. And because the light or the radiation is undergoing a large number of reflections and uh, reaching the surface, it is somewhat integrated over all the directions and therefore, what you have is a an illumination on the sample which is diffuse and coming from the entire hemisphere. That is why the surface is exposed or illuminated by radiation coming on along all the hemispherical directions of the hemisphere. So, the incident light on the surface is coming from the entire hemisphere and now what I am doing is I am looking at one particular direction by making a hole at another place on the sphere through which I am going to look at the radiation which is coming out. This radiation which is coming out is essentially coming <coughs> from the reflecting sample at a certain angle to the surface. Therefore, this is the directional reflectivity I am looking at but the illumination is over the entire hemisphere and therefore, in this arrangement I have got a hemispherical directional reflectivity measurement. So, what I have to do is to measure the 
total incident radiation and measure the reflected radiation and from these two I will be able to find out what is the reflectivity of the surface for hemispherical directional reflectivity. So, I am not going into great details this is just to explain the way the integrating sphere works and then how it can be used for measurement of hemispherical directional reflectivity. The second arrangement is slightly different it is the directional hemispherical reflectivity. In the previous case the illumination of the sample was along was on the hemisphere was from all the directions of the hemisphere and the reflection was measured in one particular direction. In the second arrangement I am going to illuminate the sample which is held at the center of the integrating sphere and I am illuminating by light coming at a certain angle. So, you see that the incident light or incident radiation is coming in this direction and the normal is shown here by this dashed line and the angle between these two is the angle theta this is the angle at which the incident radiation is coming and falling on the sample. So, what happens at the sample? At the sample it gets reflected in all the directions of course, the sample may be fully diffuse reflector, it may be a specular reflector, it may be neither specular nor diffuse it is one of those intermediate cases. So, we have seen this already in the last lecture we have described what happens at a surface when reflection takes place for an arbitrary surface. So, the radiation is going to leave in all directions and now I am going to integrate the radiation leaving. In the previous case the, the radiation incident on the surface was integrated in this case we are integrating the reflected radiation. Therefore, it is incident at a given angle and then reflected on along all the directions of the hemisphere and I have indicated some of the rays they come here get reflected several times and then comes to the det detector is actually placed against the hole on the integrating sphere. It is very essential in this particular case to see that there is no direct incident light falling on the detector and therefore, we must shield the detector from direct radiation. In this case of course, the sample itself is shielding the detector from the radiation which may fall directly on that. So, that is it is the sample is also doing the business of being a shield and uh, let us just see what happens here incident light comes here at this particular angle to the normal gets reflected in all direction I have taken one or two the different rays coming out one is coming here one more second reflection third reflection fourth reflection and so on. So, a large number of reflections take place and the light which is arriving at the detector is actually proportional to the amount which is reflected along all the hemispherical directions. Therefore, in this measurement I get the directional hemispherical reflectivity that means, the it is illuminated at one angle and what is uh, leaving in all the other directions is measured. In the previous case it is the hemispherical directional that means, it is illuminated along all the directions possible and what is leaving in one particular direction or reflected in one particular direction is measured. These are the two essential measurements which are made in practice and if the incident the if the sample is opaque we can relate the reflection reflectivity and it and the absorptivity we can reflect we can relate them and therefore, this can be used for measuring the absorptivity of the surface also it is nothing but 1 minus the reflectivity. Of course, in this case the absorptivity will be for directional hemispherical absorptivity or in the previous case it will be hemispherical directional absorptivity because absorption plus absorption coefficient absorptivity plus the reflectivity must be equal to 1 for an opaque surface. We are not going to consider translucent or uh, semi transparent media because that is somewhat more involved and we will avoid that. Of course, in this all these measurements we assume that the sample itself is not going to emit too much radiation therefore, essentially we have to keep the sample at a low enough temperature. So, that the ra emitted radiation from the sample itself is not going to be important. In other words, if the incident light is of very high intensity 
compared to what would be emitted from the sample, then the sample emission, emission from the sample can be ignored. Otherwise, we have to devise a method by which the emission has to be measured separately and from the sample because of its own temperature and then we will have to account for it. So, that will be a source of error in this particular measurement. So, two different methods we have discussed and I am just showing a picture of an integrating sphere and it is available from a manufacturer. In this case, I have taken it from the website www.electrooptical.com. They are the manufacturers of this integrated sphere. The integrating sphere is this sphere here with a opening. This opening is to provide, for example, in this case, the application for which this is being used is to provide a uniform intensity radiation coming out from this port. Essentially, what has been done, what has been done is inside the integrating sphere, a lamp whose output we want to measure a lamp whose output we have to want to measure is placed and the lamp gives out radiation in all the directions and because of the integrating sphere the light the, the radiation leaving through this hole essentially is proportional to that which is leaving in all the directions so this can be used for measuring the luminous output of a lamp suppose we have a standard lamp for which the luminous output is known we can place this standard lamp inside this integrating sphere, find out what is the intensity of the radiation leaving this by looking at the this uh, port and measuring the using a detector to detect that radiation. So, you get a reading corresponding to a source of known luminous intensity. Now, you replace the, the source of known luminous intensity with that whose intensity has to be luminous output has to be measured and then you do the measurement again. By comparing these two, we can find out what is the luminous intensity or luminosity of the light source. This is one essential method which is used by manufacturers of light bulbs and so on because standards require such measurements. We can also use it for uh, the, the if you look at the size of this integrating sphere, it can be anywhere from a few inches or few centimeters in diameter to a few meters in diameter. That is, the, I am talking about this diameter. In uh, illumination industry, where you test out very large uh, sources of light, large uh, uh, bulbs, for example, you need a very large integrating sphere because the larger the integrating sphere, the more accurate is the measurement the errors are minimized. For example, if I want to take a, take a fluorescent fitting and look at what is the amount of light which is coming from the fluorescent fitting, I have to the size of the fluorescent fitting may be several may be a meter or so in length. Therefore, I have to put it inside an integrating sphere which may be 2 or 3 meter diameter. Such integrating spheres are actually available. Of course, they are very expensive, but they are available and we can use them for measuring the luminosity of a light source. So, the three uses of the integrating spheres I have discussed, the first two being the measurement of reflectivity hemispherical directional or directional hemispherical, the third one is the luminosity of a light source. Let us look at the typical coating characteristics of a integrating sphere, this is taken from the manufacturers uh, website www.melesgrio, they are manufacturers of uh, such equipment and uh, the reflectivity typically uh, this is for use between about uh, uh, 300 or so uh, nanometers to about uh, 2500 nanometers visible and the infrared part of the spectrum. We will co we usually call this as the near, near infrared. You see that the reflectivity is very high and more or less uniform but of course small variations here but essentially what we have is a uniform reflectivity high reflectivity uniform reflectivity and highly diffuse reflectivity so this is a typical coating which of course i we are not they have not mentioned what is the coating it is a patented coating which they use in their manufacturing process 
So, the next uh, apparatus I am going to discuss is called the integrating radiometer. This is slightly different from what we have discussed earlier. In the earlier case, the integrating sphere was actually coated with a diffuse surface or diffuse coating, highly reflecting but diffuse. Here, I am not going to use a diffuse reflector, I am going to use a specular reflector. Let us look at the operating principle and uh, describe what is going to happen. So, we have essentially a an aluminum with a mirror surface inside, aluminum sphere, spherical surface with a mirror finish on the inside. And what I am going to do is I am going to have the test surface and the detector side by side like this. The if you take this as the axis of the this is the vertical axis, the sample is placed here or the test surface is placed here and the thermopile which is the detector for radiation is placed on this side, such that whatever light which leaves at this place will come after focus after being reflected will impinge on the thermopile. It is a focusing arrangement. The light will leave this surface in all the directions and will be reflected and after reflection it is going to fall on the thermopile. Okay, this is a therefore, it is integrating because it is going to focus the all the radiation leaving the test surface in all the directions on to the thermopile. So, integration is done by a slightly different method, multiple reflections are not talked about here, it is only the focusing arrangement. So, we can adjust and rotate this tire and uh, bring bring this uh, make adjustment for the positions and so on. Thermopile is the element which is going to uh, measure the reflected radiation or the emitted radiation, whatever is emitted or reflected. Suppose I illuminate it from a particular direction, then it will leave in all the directions. It is exactly the same like what we had earlier. You can illuminate the sample by bringing in radiation from outside, or you can even put a surface there which is heated and therefore, the radiation emitted from the surface will itself come to focus on the thermopile and therefore, in a way this can be used for measuring the emissivity of the surface. So, emissivity is nothing but the radiation emitted from the surface which is per unit area per unit time. If I compare it with a black body at the same temperature that ratio is going to be called the emissivity. Therefore, in the integrating radiometer it is the self radiation from the sample surface or test surface which is coming out because of its temperature and what I am doing is measuring the total amount of radiation coming from the surface and I am going to compare it with a black body. Sometimes the black body is also arranged here, so that alternatively I can have the black body and the test surface being exposed, so that I will measure alternatively the black body source radiation from the black body source and the radiation from the test surface so that the ratio can be taken and then we can get the emissivity of the process. So, with this let us now look at the emissivity measurement, even though the previous one is actually an emissivity measurement, I am looking at some specific uh, methods of measuring emissivity, which I am going to look at now. So, before we do that, let me just uh, go to the board and uh, discuss a few issues before we get back to that. So, emissivity is a surface property So, it is a comparison between emission from a test surface divided by emission from a black body. both at the same temperature this is very important to remember that the this ratio which we will refer represent as epsilon <coughs> we already seen when we were discussing pyrometry 
that MCT plays an important role in the measurement of temperature using a pyrometer because there again we were doing exactly the same thing we are comparing the radiation coming from the test object whose temperature I want to measure and I was comparing with the test with a standard lamp whose, or whose temperature is known or whose current I vary such that its temperature can be altered and uh, we were measuring what was the called the brightness temperature. So, we will just re to recapitulate to recapitulate we, we remember the idea of brightness temperature. It was defined in such a way that epsilon times sigma times T B to the power of 4 sigma T B to the power of 4 where T B is the brightness temperature of the object is equal to epsilon sigma T actual to the power of 4. When I am talking about total parametry that means that I am using the entire spectrum of radiation. So, you see that the emissivity plays a role in this particular case. Therefore, the knowledge of emissivity is very important for measurement of temperature because I am going to find out what is this, this is measured and if it is known then I can estimate this. Therefore, one important use of measurement of emissivity is in the application to measurement of temperature in pyrometry. Of course, there are other important uh, applications also. If you have any surface which is uh, subject to incoming radiation and it is subject to a temperature different from this ambient, it will also lose heat or gain heat from the surroundings and therefore, energy balance on such a surface requires a knowledge of the properties of the surface. Therefore, you can say that for example, if you have a spacecraft you want to model the thermal the thermal processes. the spacecraft may be may be actually generating heat inside because of some process which is taking place some electronic equipment may be there and so on. So, you want to keep the spacecraft at a desired temperature level. So, we have to model the thermal processes this requires the important thing we require is the emissivity and of course, the emissivity also means other properties like absorptivity because they are related to each other and then the reflectivity and so on. Emissivity measurement is important. Therefore, we want to look at some of the methods which can be used and let us look at some of them. So, one way of doing it is if you take a cavity, cavity is simply a closed vessel and if I put an object inside and uh, let us assume that the temperature is constant measured I uh, maintained at T infinity and I put a surface inside a small sample. So, let us call it a small sample. whose uh, emissivity I want to measure small sample. So, this can be this sample has got a certain mass then a specific heat we will call it C surface area we will call it as yes. So, let us look at what is going to happen. Suppose, I heat the sample by some means and uh, 
at t equal to 0 I initially bring the temperature of the sample to some value greater than t infinity. So, t sample at t equal to 0 is greater than t infinity and I will remove the source of heat. So, initially I heated it the sample is heated to a temperature greater than t infinity may be for 25 degrees, 30 degrees, 40 degrees whatever above the t infinity and I start allowing it to cool and if I assume that the sample is very small and uh, there are no not no temperature gradients within I can assume that the sample is at a uniform temperature and I can measure the temperature of the sample measure T s as a function of time. So, what would you get? You would get what is called a cooling curve So, you will get a cooling curve which will mean that the temperature of the sample which was higher than the T infinity start with will start reducing and of course, if you wait long enough it will come to the same temperature as the cavity temperature. We will assume for the moment that we have a high vacuum inside. we assume that there is a high vacuum inside that means there is no heat transfer from the or the heat loss from the sample by conduction or convection conduction to the medium or convection to the medium and we will also assume that for heating this sample we need some method of bringing the heat into it we can bring it through very thin wires and electrically heat the sample. So, if the wires are thin enough we can assume that the heat loss through the wires is very small and ignore them in the limit. Of course, you can account for it by a finer measurement, but we will just assume therefore, cooling curve will be governed by the following equation. This is already familiar to us, this is nothing but the first order system we have discussed earlier m c d t by d t the rate of change of temperature multiplied by the mass into specific heat this should be equal to the heat loss from the system or if you want you can say this is equal to minus m c d t by d t is equal to epsilon of the surface then the surface area of the surface then sigma t s to the power of 4 which is the function of time minus t infinity to the power of this is a constant. So, we will say this is constant <coughs> and uh, these are measurable. I can measure the mass of the system specific heat if I know the material and its characteristic another experiment I can perform to measure the specific heat. The surface area is measurable sigma is the Stefan Boltzmann constant this is 5.67 into 10 to the power of minus 8 t infinity is held fixed then t s can be measured as a function of time and therefore, essentially what you get is that if you with a t s at t equal to 0. So, this is also t s here is equal to t not greater than t infinity this is what we have. This equation when you integrate this equation you will get a get the cooling curve. So, the cooling curve will have a characteristic which is dependent on the magnitude of epsilon. If epsilon is small the cooling rate will be very small. So, it will take a long time for it to cool down and if epsilon is large it will cool down more rapidly. Therefore, the rate at which the cooling takes place or the temperature variation with respect to time has the information about the emissivity in that particular curve the curve is specific or has a specific dependence on the emissivity of the surface. So, let us look at a typical cooling curve I have just solved that equation for a typical system with a small mass and specific heat and so on. <coughs> 
So, I am just not giving all the information here, I am just showing you what is going to happen. If I measure, if I plot the cooling curves for different values of emissivity, I have taken 0 0.1, 0 0.3, 0 0.5 and 0 0.8, these are the four values. All the other parameters, the mass specific heat and the surface area are held fixed and therefore, only emissivity is going to change the cooling curve. So, you can see that the cooling curve for very low emissivity epsilon equal to 0.1, epsilon equal to 0.3, then we have epsilon equal to 0.5 and epsilon equal to 0.8. You see that the cooling is more and more rapid as the emissivity is becoming larger and larger. In other words, I can note down or measure the temperature as a function of time and uh, let us see what if what is going to happen when you do that. If you do that, if I measure the temperature as a function of time, so I can prepare it a table like this. This is the time versus the temperature T s and I can say this is 0, this was let us say 350 Kelvin, this is in Kelvin and let us say 15 seconds, this is seconds. 339, 25 from 328, things like that. So, you make a table like this. Okay. So, how do we get the emissivity from this such a curve? That is what I am looking at now. So, what I can do is, I can assume that the cooling curve, I can solve the equation which I gave little while ago for different values of epsilon and I have to find out that particular epsilon which gives you the best uh, uh, match with the data you got. So, for this what we will do is, so to estimate emissivity by using the principle of least squares we have already talked about earlier principle of least squares and that is very simply specified as under. So, this is uh, number 1, 2, 3 etcetera. This is the identifier. So, we will say number, I will call it i. So, what I will do is, I will find out, take the sum of the squares of the following form i equal to 1 to n of T s i measured minus T s i assumed epsilon whole squared. So, I am going to, I have the measured values here. I will assume a certain epsilon and find out this these values for the same T values. T s i corresponds to T at measured at this time values and T s i assumed with assumed epsilon I am going to calculate. So, I require that this sum, is, sum of these squares must be the smallest. So, minimize s. Yes. What is done in practice is to use some kind of a search technique because the solution is not straightforward, it is nonlinear. So, we can use a search technique like the one we used or we, dis we discussed earlier when we were talking about uh, the fitting data with uh, nonlinear curves. So, you can use a search technique. What does this search technique do? it starts with some assumed value of epsilon and then calculates this sum of squares and then finds out what is the value and then it calculates the with a small change in epsilon again you recalculate the whole thing find out whether it is going up or down. That is you look at the way s is changing. So, what we do is we go in the direction of reducing s and then 
we keep on changing epsilon by small amount smaller and smaller amount and maybe if I show it graphically you will get something like this. So, I will have something like this s is calculated with the values of epsilon. So, I may get a value of like this and like this like this and after some time it will again start going up. Therefore, what I will do is I will go to the bottom of this curve. So, it is supposedly a curve like this and I will go to the bottom of this curve and find out this is the estimate for. So, we will call this is the best estimate for the emissivity. So, basically the method I have given in brief is called parameter estimation. It is a parameter estimation problem. It is also referred to sometimes as the inverse problem, because we are solving the direct problem with different values of epsilon and finding out that value of epsilon which is the best from the viewpoint of minimizing the, the sum of the squares of the errors. Because in the previous slide if you see what we have done, this is nothing but the error with respect to error between the measured and the assumed value of with this, this is obtained with an assumed value of epsilon. So, the difference between these two can be looked upon as an error, because if the value of epsilon is the correct value, I should get the smallest error, because then these two should be closest to each other. We are using the least square principle, because there is no other better way of doing it, okay. because epsilon is truly unknown and the only way we can do that is to use a method like this, which is parameter estimation and this is just like fitting a curve, because we are trying to fit a curve, such that the value of the s comes to this particular position, the minimum possible. Of course, if you change the epsilon further, it will go up and in many of the applications of this method for determination of emissivity, we can get plus or minus 0 0.1, 0 0.01 uh, accuracy. That means, that I can say epsilon estimated is equal to epsilon true plus or minus something like 0 0.01. That is possible. If you do the experiment carefully and if you use the parameter estimation method by taking the data and then doing the least squares analysis, one would be able to get a value like that. So, this is one way of doing the emissivity measurement and here you, has, you see that we are using a transient method, we are allowing some object to cool and we are using a evac evacuated vessel and uh, the sample is very small compared to the size of the vessel. Therefore, reflected radiation or the radiation reflected from the walls do not come onto the surface of the thing. Therefore, you need to have a small sample and small sample also means that it will probably cool more uniformly throughout and therefore, it is also better from the point of view of the assumptions we have made in the analysis. So, this is one method which I am going to have uh, discussed and let us look at what are the other methods which are possible. The next method I am going to look at is the use of what is called a portable emissometer. This uh, emissometer is made by a company called devices and services company. So, I will come back to this later. So, let us look at the principle of operation of the portable emissometer. I have uh, taken this sketch from the paper by Cole, Weaver and McElroy in review of scientific instruments, which appeared in 1990. What it consists of essentially is a emissometer, this is the emissometer and it is placed on a heat sink and the sample whose emissivity I want to measure must be placed on the heat sink, so that the temperature of the sample remains close to the temperature of the ambient that is the requirement. So, you have a heat sink, so that the sample, sample is a for example, it could be a thin sample in the form of a plate whose dimensions could be for example, 50 to 100 millimeters or even smaller than that 
because we are going to use a very small area of the sample for the measurement itself. And uh, the emissometer itself head itself consists of you can see here the detail there is an arrangement by which we can heat this and there are two detector elements high emissivity detector elements these are high emissivity and these are two low emissivity detector elements they are basically thermopiles they are basically thermopiles which are arranged in this particular fashion and we can supply heat to the head so that the entire thing comes to a certain temperature the temperature is usually uh, about 350 kelvin now let us look at how this portable emissometer works suppose i keep the emissometer uh, like it is shown here i have a standard material here whose emissivity is known and i have kept the the head of the emissometer inverted down on that therefore we have the low emissivity and high emissivity detector elements placed very close in close proximity of the surface whose emissivity i want to measure okay so what will happen if i have two objects close to each other the heat transfer between the head which is heated and the surface of the sample which is not heated which is at the presumably at the room temperature the heat transfer between these two elements will depend on the difference in temperature to raise to the power of 4 t to the power of t t to the power of 4 of the detector minus d t sample to the power of 4 and t sample to the power of 4 is a constant because it is going to be the room temperature the temperature of this is going to be in the in the case of uh, the sam the the sample and the detectors are very close to each other the radiation the heat transfer is only by radiation okay and depending on the emissivity of this object the amount of heat transfer will be different for the low emissivity detector elements and the high emissivity detector elements so what will happen is that there will be a small temperature difference between these two because of the different rates at which heat transfer take place between the elements and the surface so now that is the basis for the thing so we are measuring we are going to measure the temperature difference between the high emissivity detector elements and low emissivity detector elements and this is going to be related to the emissivity of the surface how, how is it done you place the head first on a high emissivity standard of emissivity equal to 0.89 this is supplied by the manufacturer and then adjust the gain of the amplifier so that the reading of the millivolt meter which is connected is going to be exactly 0.89 okay and then you remove the high emissivity standard and put a low emissivity standard and again adjust the there is an adjustment for the that so that the value which you get is the equal to 0 0.06 corresponding to the emissivity of the low emissivity standard and of course this process can be repeated again and again so that you finally get a condition where when you replay when you change it from the high emissivity to low emissivity the readings do not change essentially the head requires about half an hour of heating time so that it is started it is heated to before you start the measurement about half an hour time is required once it is done then the measurements can be done within by almost in real time 15 to 20 seconds is what is what is required for measurement okay so why do we have a heat sink the heat sink is to make sure that the the sample which i am going to use is going to be at the room temperature therefore the heat sink is going to remove the heat any heat which is falling on it because of the proximity of the heated head that amount of heat has to be removed whatever heat transfer take place it has to be removed quickly so that the temperature remains more or less fixed at the room temperature value so the instrument is supposed to be very dependable the measurement is at room temperature the emissivity we are measuring is at room temperature not at elevated temperatures the emissivity is accurate to within plus or minus 0 0.01 and that is also the least count of the the millivolt meter which is going to be connected to the the, the instrument 
and uh, let us look at the way the instrument looks. This is a photograph of the instrument taken from the manufacturer's website devices and services dot com. They are the manufacturers of this particular emissometer. The emissometer, this is the head of the emissometer and the cable which is going to be connected to that and uh, the surface, this is the heat sink on which it is, it is uh, placed and this is the millivolt meter which is directly connected to that and the reading here directly gives the reading of the emissivity of the surface. So, it is a very simple instrument, very small in size, the diameter is something like uh, 50 mm and uh, it uh, does not require too much of uh, the power consumed is very small, it requires very little of uh, maintenance and so on, it is a very highly reliable instrument. And uh, let us look at the specifications given by the manufacturers. It is a readout type instrument that means that you use the D and S scaling digital voltmeter, it is model R D 1 if you use that or a high impedance voltmeter with a resolution of 0 0.01 millivolts is required. The output is 2.4 millivolts nominal with a sample emissivity of 0.9 that means if you use the high emissivity sample the output of the instrument is 2.4 millivolts and a sample temperature of 25 degrees which is what we have, we have taken in this particular case. The linearity is very good, the detector output is linear with emissivity within plus or minus point, this is point not 0.01, not point 0.1. The time constant is 10 seconds nominal, that means that you, you should give a little more time than 10 seconds, maybe 30 or 40 seconds by the time the value will stabilize and you will be able to take a reading of the emissivity of the surface. So, we have to recapitulate what we have done is we have looked at the various ways of measuring the reflectivity and then we have discussed two methods of measuring the emissivity specifically. One is the cooling rate method or the cooling curve method where we allow the surface to cool in vacuum because in vacuum the radiation heat transfer is purely by radiation and by look by by parameter estimation methods we are able to find out what is the emissivity of the surface. And then we have also discussed a portable emissometer which uh, directly measures emissivity by a readout kind of arrangement. There are many other situations where emissivity may be required. For example, if you remember pyrometry, we said that pyrometers are used for very high temperatures. So, if you want to know what is the emissivity of the surface at high temperature, there is no other alternative but to heat the, heat the surface to a high temperature. So, the actual surface whose emissivity I want at high temperature, I must heat it to a temperature as high as required and then we have to make the measurement of the emitted radiation coming from that compared with the black body and get the emissivity value. So, this is what we have to do and in the case of pyrometer, we also know that we are going to use a specific wavelength or specific frequency of radiation. That means, that I have to make the measurement of the emissivity as a function of wavelength or it is a spectral quantity I am interested in. So, some of the complications in radiation measurement are because we need high temperatures sometimes, we need sometimes the spectral measurements and therefore, these require expensive equipment and the method of measurement is not like what we have discussed. These are all simple techniques which we have talked about here, more complicated systems are required. Let me also look at one last thing about uh, the measurement of uh, surface properties and that is the angular measurement. Angular reflectivity, it is also called the biangular reflectivity. If you remember for any surface, if the radiation is coming in particular direction here, it will reflect in all directions and therefore, there is a, if you draw the normal here, this is the incident, this is the reflected. So, for each direction I have to measure the reflectivity, each direction. When I, I have incident light, what I have is light coming in in a small cone onto the surface and of course, I have to measure along the same cone which is reflected. So, in the case of biangular reflectivity, we require what is called a goniometer. 
which is a an apparatus which allows us to illuminate the surface at any desired angle with respect to the normal and at the same time look at reflected radiation at any angle to the normal. Of course, the way I have shown it here the two angles are in the same plane, they need not be in the same plane. The incident that is I am talking about the plane of this figure I have written here. It can be coming in one direction and going in any of the 2 pi radians, steradians from on the hemisphere. So, if I show that uh, schematically, so we can uh, show it like this. So, if I show the this is the hemisphere, the sample is here, this is normal, it can come from in this direction from the sphere and it can go out in this direction, you may be interested in this. So, they are not necessarily in the same plane, okay. we are talking about biangular that means this is the incident radiation, this is the same. Of course, this requires very expensive equipment, the goniometer makes it possible to have incident radiation coming in this direction and the reflected uh, radiation in any given direction can be measured and uh, you will also see that if the amount of radiation coming and falling here is some value, the amount reflected in this direction may be very small. That means, that the because it is going to be going in all directions, the amount going in this particular direction may be a very small quantity. Therefore, we must have a very accurate, very sensitive detection is required, sensitive detection, detection is because the amount which is going in that particular direction is going to be very small. What is the connection between this and the hemispherical directional or direction hemispherical? Let us just look at that. If I were to integrate the radiation going in all the directions, that is what we did in the integrating sphere case. That means, that if I measure the reflectivity in all the directions and add all the reflected radiation in different directions together that will be the actual reflectivity of the surface which is given by this directional spherical reflectivity. Directional hemispherical reflectivity will be given by the net radiation coming in this direction any given direction and the net radiation is going in all the other direction. If I can integrate or if I measure in all the possible directions and then if I integrate that by numerical method, I will be able to find out what is the directional hemispherical reflectivity of the surface and this integration has to be done by making measurements of each along each direction and then summing them and then getting the integral value. Whereas, if you have the integrating sphere, it does this integration automatically that is the great advantage. So, if you are interested only in the directional hemispherical or hemispherical directional, we need not go for a goniometer, but where do you require the goniometer? It is required for calibration because the if you are using the integrating sphere to relate the measured values from that to the absolute values of reflectivity, we require a calibration and that is provided by goniometer type of measurement, which is done in a standard laboratory to characterize surfaces by actually measuring the directional properties and from that finding out what is the hemispherical directional or directional hemispherical property of the surface. I think with that we will stop our discussion about the measurement of surface properties. In the next lecture, I am going to look at what happens if you have participating media. If I have a volume of material which is absorbing or scattering radiation, how do we measure those quantities? The application will be to combustion devices where application where gases do absorb and emit radiation and in pollution monitoring, monitoring we also require. So, I will discuss a few measurement technique for this particular type of situation where participating media are involved, where emission, scattering and other such properties are to be measured for a volume source. In the, till now, we have looked at only surfaces, now we are going to look at volume sources of radiation. Thank you.